Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, this is our friend Rustam from Norway, and from Java Bean, uh, it's our um, it's a Java community in Norway, and they organize uh, one. I think even the biggest conference in Europe, I guess, is Java Zone, and right. we were there like guests. And it was super awesome, so we, we are trying uh, <laughs> to get there, at least for in southern part of Europe. Okay, so um, how many languages do you speak, not uh, including programming languages? Uh, like the normal languages. I think yes. it's pretty much around five. But five like, languages, I, oh. I can, I can do a couple of more if I have to, but like uh -huh. just... just basic ones. Do you but use them like on some <sighs> monthly basis? Or? Yeah, well, it depends on the language really, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so now we are going to be back to the developing developers' languages, so yep. enjoy. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, today I want to talk to you about... Um, I called it the developer nightmares, but I would like to you actually to look at the opposite side of that, of like the, the paradise or the, this really nice place where we really want to be. And by uh, telling you about those nightmares, I'm going to tell you some stories, how things uh, worked out or did not work out and why you should do certain things and why you should avoid certain things, right? So um, my name is Rustam. I, uh, as it's already been... Uh, uh, I was introduced just a second ago, and I am um, um, just a few things that um, just a few logos to 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 shortly introduce myself. I work in a consultancy company in Norway. I have been leading. I, I was a leader of uh, Java in the region Java user group for a couple of years. Uh, then I uh, stopped doing that. I went over to being a leader of this. Uh, conference that we already talked about a little bit called Java Zone, which is a pretty big, probably the, definitely Euros, maybe possibly the world's biggest community-driven conference, a Java conference. Uh, and also, uh, I am a uh, Java champion. So, uh, enough about me. Today, I want to talk to you about the things that I have experienced, because last few years, I've been doing a lot of uh, projects where people hire me to do... Uh, a software uh, review or a project review or even a company review to do like to do some kind of audit to check how the, uh, the software is in that company in that project or things like that and after analyzing uh, quite a bit of those projects I kind of um, thought that okay um, what kind of main things that we should kind of bring with us and make it better and what what things people usually uh, do in a not exactly super optimal way. Uh, and by big projects, I usually mean that projects that are more than 350,000 line lines of code, 350 and more. And I've worked on a, quite a few of those projects myself, uh, working as both a developer, as an architect, as a uh, tech lead, and all those kind of things. And then I was also evaluating those kind of projects. So. Looking at those projects and, and making sure that uh, making sure to note all the good parts and all the kind of less good parts, and uh, so I kind of starting started to writing things down, and then it became a, uh, a, a a short presentation at work, and then it became a bigger thing, and and then I did the, this presentation quite a few other places. Um, so, um, paradise, or, well, a nightmare and on the other side, as I told you already, right? Um, what is it? And usually it, it, it consists of very, very obvious things, you might think, which are kind of the things that you have seen, you have, like, used, you, you know what's it about. So, right, it's, it's not a big surprise that it is about, um, it's about code, and all those things that connected to the code, it's about tools that you use to, uh, to make all that work. And it's also about the documentation, right? Uh, to make things a little bit easy uh, for myself and a bit more fun, and also probably a little bit more fun for you, I created a couple of uh, tiny little helpers. And well, I mean, it's uh, just prepare yourselves. It's like, it's a fantastic piece of art. I spent hours and hours drawing those. And it's like, it's definitely me, not a me 12 year old. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's a bad thing, right? I told you, it's a fantastic piece of art. And the good thing is this. 
And uh, the funny story is that I once, uh, at one conference, you could print a T-shirt with like a custom drawing. So I bring that one, that unicorn, and I was like, can you print this on a T-shirt? And I was like, yeah, sure. Oh, this is so cute. Did your daughter draw that? And I was like, <clears throat> yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, that was her. That was her. Definitely her. So yeah. Okay. Before. Uh, before we go to uh, today, I want to go a little bit back, like kind of 20-ish, 15 years back. No, it's 20. It's almost 20. Uh, it's a bit more than 20. Time, time flies. Um, so, 90s. Maybe mid-90s, end of 90s, th things like that, right? Um, what, what happened there? So, well, the first thing that happened was it was a time of uh, waterfalls, right? No scrum, no nothing like that. It was like a time of waterfalls, and well, some of them were really spectacular as this one. Some of them were like more like a train wreck. But well, still, we did that, and that was kind of the mainstream thing, right? And uh, 90s development, how did we do that? How did we run, run, wrote Java code back then? Well, we did write it in notepads and stuff, and we used uh, Emacs and Wim or whatever, anything, but we didn't have like a proper IDEs and things like that. All the Eclipse and NetBeans and uh, IntelliJs and all of them, they came much later. And uh, well, it was kind of bad, right? It was not really, but if you think about it today, oh, do I have to run my code or write my code in Notepad? Then it, you would kind of think it's a bit nightmarish, right? Um, versioning, what did we do with the versioning? Well, um, I started working with uh, a kind of legacy-ish system which used Visual Source Safe, and I'm not talking about Visual Source Safe or anything that is kind of resembles it right now. I'm talk talking about the thing that it used to be in the end of 90s. That's the one I saw, and that was, well, anyone remembers that? OK, any ha anyone has good memories about that? Ah, good. <laughs> there was no hands, just for the record, uh, for, for the second question. Uh, <laughs> OK, and what we did also was uh, also CVS, which was a little bit less painful, but still quite a lot of pain. So. Uh, zombies again, right? Kind of scary. Um, then how we did compilations and builds, and that was also fun. And I was also, I actually managed to see that because I ended up working on a quite a big monolithic kind of legacy-ish project, and we were still doing that there. And we were doing class passes, we were building up in bat files. Uh, and then we would just run uh, things also from bat files or from command line. We would just run Java with all that class paths and everything in it. And just like, well, can you imagine when you have like uh, 15 bat files with lots and lots and lots of lines of code and something breaks and there is like a bunch of go to's in it between and, and across the files and how fun it is to, to do debug that? Well, yeah. Um, that one is fun. That one, actually, I haven't seen myself. I asked a colleague of mine to, I was like, okay, I'm doing this talk. Can you help me to do, can you tell me of something like really horrific? And he was like, yeah, I have one thing. And I was like, what was that? Well, it was about issue tracking. So like if now we have all these bug trackers, issue trackers, Jira's, whatever, anything, right? Anything works and it, it's quite okay. And he was like, well, you know, back in the days, we had to do it in a really horrible way. And I was like, well, what was that? Well, you know, we had to do it in MS Access. And I was like, yeah, OK, well, it kind of sucks. But what is so bad about it? He was like, well, wait, 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 I'm not done talking. Uh, it's MS Access in a shared network folder. So I mean, you remember how MS Access works? It's just like one database file, and you have one client. It doesn't support like several clients and everything. And like you have several people writing to the same database on a network on a network shared drive, what can possibly go wrong there, right? You would think. Um, but now things are much better, right? We have these fantastic tools. We have all those things are gone. Uh, we have a uh, way of developing software that is fantastic. We have lots of uh, tools. We have cloud that like scales automatically, and everything is so, so, so amazing until this happens. So this is actually a real tweet that I saw a couple of, uh, couple of months, well, some time ago. 
which is really, really well describes the situation that you often meet when you go as a consultant or actually as an as a employee or any, uh, any kind of role, you go into a project and then you're like, okay, well, I have some codes. Uh, well, it's, maybe it's a little bit legacy, maybe it's a new code, but still, uh, do you have tests? Well, I don't. Oh, okay. Uh, do you have any specification? Well, kind of. Are there like word files on, on the shared network drive somewhere, well forgotten, under tons of dust, and nobody knows how to, what to do about it and what to use it, and they haven't been updated for the last three years, and the architect who wrote them, he quit like three years ago. And then you're like, yeah, okay, fine. Then I'll just try to fix something. And then you fix something, and then you break a ton of other things. And then you're like, well, thank you for that. Sounds familiar? <laughs> good, good, good. Lots of hands. Awesome. Um, so going back to what we started uh, talking about. So you, you have this developer's paradise, this fantastic thing where you can, uh, you can have all of it, it's, it's just works and it's fantastic. You just, every, every day is a happy day scenario and things like that. Um, and then we're gonna look at like each part of that. So we, we will, we'll start with the code, we'll go with tools, and then we'll, we'll, at the end we'll go into the documentation part. And documentation is actually quite important thing which quite often gets ignored because, well, it's not as fun as writing code, right? Exactly the same thing, like it's not as fun writing tests as code, like what Alex said just a bit earlier. Um, it sounds familiar, right? It sounds like something you've heard before. It sounds like all of those things and all of those things that I'm going to mention will have some kind of connection to continuous X. So it could be continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous develop, you know, all delivery, all those kind of things. Um, and it's kind of right, but the thing is that it is, well, it is a very nice thing, but usually it's being sold to you as like, oh, well, you know what? Either you're doing continuous delivery or you're kind of old legacy bad project. And it's usually sold as like big rocket ship that will bring you to the moon and back and maybe some other really nice, funny places. And, but the thing is that you don't have to do it that way. The thing is, my argument is that you can do it little by little, one little piece at a time, and it will still bring you to this nice, uh, funny, sunny, uh, awesome place of uh, being like your everyday work kind of thing. And it might be like being a consultant, maybe also uh, you looking for a new job, looking for a new uh, project or whatever, and then you talk to people and then they talk to you. And I'll, those, all those things that I'm going to tell you now, they will give you some little bit of uh, like a few questions that you can ask when you actually go to that place, and then you can uh, uh, you can see how what kind of project that is. The other thing is that it's also a bunch of arguments that I'm going to give you uh, to help you. Uh, to argument against, uh, well, because there will be a lot of people saying like, oh, uh, you will come there and you'll see, say, uh, well, we need to write tests. So next two weeks I'm going to be, well, I'm, I'm exaggerating now, but say next two weeks I'm going to be uh, not writing any new code. I'm going to stay uh, at work. I'm going to write a bunch of tests. It will make a system so fantastic, stable and everything. And then you have uh, some kind of stakeholder, project manager, whatever. It was like, um, what? You're going to do like work for two weeks that will not give me anything, will not give me any new functionality, no nothing, and you want me to pay for that. And uh, funny enough, you actually get to hear that a lot from customers, especially who are like, oh, well, you want me to pay you as a, oh, not me, but like anyone, you in general, uh, as a consultant to do work that will not give me anything, will not bring me new features, will not fix my bugs and everything. And then you're like, but, 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 but. But then, then, well, no, 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 you cannot do that. And then I will give you, try to give you some, some hints and try to give you some, some arguments to help you with that. And also, like Aaron, my good friend Aaron just said a few hours earlier here on the same stage, he said it's all about the result, not about the process. So all those things of writing tests, writing deliveries, uh, automating stuff and everything is a process. The result is a stable system. So that's what you usually have to ask. That's like, just remember that. 
ask for the result and say like, hey, do you want a system that doesn't break down? Do you want a system that is resilient? Do you want a system that is easy to rebuild? And then they will say yes, and it's like, okay, this is the things that you have to do. This is the road, right? So, um, the moving parts are all of these things, right? Uh, the code, the tools, and the documentation. So let's start with the development part, so the code, right? Uh, the first thing I want to mention is the code quality. And things I usually do when, when somebody asks me to do a re review of a project, I usually start looking at the code. Well, because we're developers, I'm a developer, I like looking at code. But that's one thing. But the other thing is that the code gives you a lot of hints. Uh, the, the most obvious one is, well, code quality, things like code standards. I usually ask, uh, uh, there was a project I asked them, I was like, hey guys, do you, do, um, do you have a code standard? And most of the cases they would say, yeah, yeah, sure, we do, yeah. Sometimes they will say, no, nah, well, no, nah, well, we didn't really think of it, blah, you know. Most of the cases they will say yes. And then you're like, cool, do you follow that? <laughs> And then they get a bit more unsure. They were like, um, mm, uh, well, you know, um, you know, uh, ooh, uh. and then you're like, okay, fine, cool, I know, okay, I, I get it, cool. And then another thing, which is uh, very, very, could be very harmless, but it could be also very critical, and I've seen it break systems, it's something as simple as encoding. You just check files on go through a code base with like some kind of tool just to see what kind of encoding. Is it the same encoding or is it different ones, right? Because uh, like in, 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 in the same thing in Serbian, but the same thing in Norwegian, you have all those weird letters, like letters that are not considered weird, weird by people who don't live in that country or the kind of unusual letters, right? Um, like this ones uh, that will... Uh, if not encoded correctly, they will, uh, in the best case, will be uh, shown in a weird way, but in the worst case, will break your system. I've seen systems actually break totally, like servers go down because it was just uh, uh, because of those letters. Then you have all Spanish, then you have like Serbian, you know, all those things. Um, another thing about code quality, which is absolutely, absolutely harmless in a way of breaking your system, but it still gives me a really good uh, idea of how you treat your code, is MIME types. Absolutely harmless thing, right? But then I looked through that, and then I, there was this project that I looked through. It was around, well, three, four hundred thousand lines of code. And, uh, and then I looked through that, I find, like, uh, I think, four or five different encodings in a file and uh, six or seven different MIME types. So Java files were considered to be a text file, HTML file, C++ file, anything kind of file. And that will not break anything, but that gives me a hint. That gives me a hint that you're probably using, you don't have like a uniform uh, number of tools that you're using to develop stuff. That means that there is a tiny little group of people, and in that project there was like five or six people working at that time, but still that means that you don't have like a uniform uh, way of developing your code, you don't do uh, checks, you don't do things. It's like it gives me some kind of hint to dig deeper. Um, Another thing which is a bit more obvious is the code reviews. And then you ask, I asked the same project, and I was like, hey, um, do you do code review? And then they were like, um, uh, nah, well, we've been working with each other so long, for so long, that we know each other, we kind of complete each other's sentences, so we don't have to do that. And I was like, what, what has that to do with the other thing? You can be completing your, your, each other's sentences, but you still might write bugs. And if, the, if you're trying to explain it to another person, they might actually see that and fix that. And then they were like, ah, oh, no, well, no, you know, no time. Nobody got time for that and everything and those kind of things, which is, again, a bad excuse, right? Uh, and talking about development tools. Uh, talking about development tools, there are like things that are also very interesting to think about. Some interesting things you can ask uh, that new project that somebody's trying to sell you to like to join them and stuff. Uh, you just say like, hey, um, do you do code versioning? Most of the cases they will say yes, right? They will be like, yeah, cool, of course we do. We do like Mercurial, Git, uh, all those things, you name it, we have it, cool. And then you do like, what do you use it for? Uh, do you use it for just 
for storing code, or you actually use it for some cool things like, I don't know, do you do branching? Do you do feature branching? Do, do, do you use your, actually your repository for something useful? Do you have checks on the commits and things like that, right? How do you, another thing that you should always ask, always like dig into what, what I usually do, that's kind of my checklist in a way, is that I was like, okay, how do you handle complexity? Do you do tests? Do you have tests on all different levels? Do you have it all the way from unit tests to, 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 to uh, integration and functional tests? And also, sometimes I hear that, like, yeah, yeah, we do testing. I was like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I checked the code base. There is not a single JUnit tests or any other ones. All I found was a JUnit library from six years back. And then you're... We're, oh, no, 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 no. We don't do... Man we, we do manual testing. We have people to do that. And you're like... No, no, this is not how it works. How do you actually make sure that the same things are actually tested? Some critical things are always tested. We people, we tend to, well, make errors, but we also tend to overlook things, right? And it's extremely boring. Why would you ask people to actually spend their time, time their lives to actually do that? Why can't you just do it as a script? And people can do fun stuff instead. And just to, to, to explain the whole story, I went to uh, Sonar Cloud, which is Sonar Cube, is like static analysis tool thing. And I looked through Java projects there. And uh, I looked at, uh, just, to, just to pick something, I picked uh, coverage, which is like test coverage. And <laughs> this is what it gives you. So if you ignore all the ones that are at zero, because that's probably the reason for that is probably that they're doing something else. But uh, those that are not zero, there is quite a bit at 100, which is cool. But there is also quite a bit in, in the middle, mid, middle there, which is uh, all of those is open source projects. And then I dig deeper. And then I looked into one specific open source project, which is, um, uh, you can see it up there. It says PMD. So PMD is actually a static ana code analysis tool that helps your code be nice and be uh, compliant to all the rules and everything, right? And if you look at what <laughs> they, they are also on the same uh, Sonar Cloud thing, and you see their test coverage is not <laughs> as fantastic as you would think. This is kind of, kind of curious thing, right? It's like, do what, what I say, not what I do kind of thing. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. And then I looked into a bit more into like what kind of bugs it was, and it was, well, you know, they were like, some of them were very, very generic, which was kind of stupid ones. And just to, just to make sure, uh, those bugs is usually, that's what you see up there when, when it says 185 bugs or vulnerabilities and all those things there. So they show up there, uh, which, well, some of them were very generic and harmless. Some of them were a little bit more nasty. But the thing is, um, you, 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 you see, I mean, like, it's, you might be sitting here as like, well, obviously, that's obvious things you're telling. Everybody does that. The point is that not everybody does that. Um, back to development tools. So we talked a little bit already about SonarCube, but uh, in general, any kind of static code analysis, if you're using SonarCube, fine. Whatever else is totally fine. PMD, all, all those things is really nice. Just pick something and use it and make sure that it's being run regularly, because uh, what usually happens is that you install a sonar or whatever, and it's forgotten, and it's not being uh, run, or it's being run once a month, and nobody sees the result. Put a big screen, make it run once a week, and show all those things that you see here uh, weekly. And it will actually, it, it, it handles that pretty well. It shows you like the arrows that things go up or down, and th how things behave, right? Okay. Um, another thing, pretty obvious. Well, use plugins. If there are plugins for your ID to do to integrate with uh, with with static code analysis tools or anything, use it. Just use it. The only thing you should make sure is that everybody is using the same rule set on the project because usually it happens. What happens is that everybody writes their own rule sets or they modify and become their own rule sets. And then I've seen that. I've seen that happen way too many times. And what happens is that it passes all your tests, but it fails all the kind of the, uh, the your neighbor's tests and it, it doesn't work on the production server and so on, so on, so on. So if you don't have the unified kind of thing, then there is less, much less point in doing that. 
Uh, one other thing that I really want to talk to you about that is a very, very often forgotten thing is those third-party libraries that you have in your project. Uh, I mean, it's kind of useless to ask you how many of you use a third-party libraries, right? Because, I mean, there will be hands everywhere. But um, how many of you actually make sure that you know your libraries? How many of you track known issues and vulnerabilities of those libraries? Anyone? One hand, two hands, three hands, four hands. Okay, nice. Okay, four hands. There is uh, quite a few people here. I mean, it's probably not even 1%, I guess. I mean, just like by rough counting. Um, that's really good. I mean, those five people, you should be proud of yourself. Rest of you, you should probably be a little bit more ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> um, another thing is that how many of you guys, it's another question coming up, uh, how many of you guys actually have a control of your licenses? Because I'm not talking about like paid, not paid. I'm talking about like Apache license, GPL, whatever, all those kind of things. One hand, two, three, four, five. Five, six, seven. Oh, nice. It's actually growing. That's really nice. Okay. So, still, seven people. Uh, again, far from probably 1% of people here. Um, um, why it's important? Well, there is, a, uh, there is a post that one of been written a couple of months ago. I found it on, 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 on online about auditing your dependencies and stuff, which explains it pretty well. But the thing is, um, sometimes you don't want your code to have a specific license. Sometimes you're working on a very critical code that you don't want to publish as, for example, uh, absolutely full 100% open source as the whole system. You might open source some parts, but you don't, because sometimes it's just uh, like a super critical government organ uh, organization, some kind of system that is very, very critical. And then I go in and I look at that and I was like, hey guys, um, you're using a, 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 a um, little piece of library, little, little library here that is GPL. You know that that makes whole your project GPL? You know that they actually people can call you and say, um, hey, um, we want to see the code for the whole thing? Because the license is like that. It actually says that. And uh, they were like, oh, um, uh, um, no. And well, this kind of things that you don't want to have, right? Another thing, which is kind of obvious thing, is that it's if, the li if those libraries are updated, maintained, compatible with each other even, right? Uh, and those kind of things are also very important to think about. There was another thing, just to, just to, to build up a little bit of that uh, argument there, is that there was the security blog post a few, well, it's almost, I think, a year ago. Uh, but that doesn't matter. I mean, it's the same thing that uh, happens all the time, where Google kind of checked all the open source projects, and then they looked into that, and then they were like, well, all of the projects, most of the projects had some kind of vulnerability. It doesn't matter what kind of vulnerability, the whole fact is that there is vulnerabilities, right? We, we sometimes write bugs, even though we don't believe so, or we don't want to think so. Um, but um, the thing is that those bugs will be patched, and you have to make sure that all your libraries are actually being updated. There are libraries, there are uh, plugins that help you with that. There are like Maven plugins and uh, Gradle, whatever, uh, anything that will help you with that. Use it. Do it manually if you have to, but just make sure that you don't forget your libraries. That usually gets forget forgotten. Another thing I want to talk to you is, is about is the... Um, the pipeline. So from you wrote the code, you committed the code, and then you're like, I'm out, I'm done, cool. New features, new challenges, fantastic, it's a happy days. But then what happens actually after it's being uh, committed till it ends up in pro production? Is the process automated or is it manual, right? Uh, is it deployed in the same way? How do you deploy it? Do you deploy it in the two different environments or you just have production? Uh, there was this funny thing, I was working, uh, I was helping a friend, uh, I wasn't really getting paid for that or anything, I was just testing this system uh, that we have in Norway uh, for a friend, just like clicking around and reporting some bugs because she asked me to have a look and I did that and I was like, um, I found a couple of bugs but I really want to dig deeper, can you give me uh, access to your test environment? And guess what she said, she was like, test what? 
And the other time, I was like, test environment? You know, where you test things? I was like, no, no, we, we have one environment. And that's production. <laughs> and then I was like, um, I think we need to talk. Another thing is obviously is tools. There, there are lots of tools. There are like some good tools, there are some bad tools, but still, pick something, choose your poison, and use it, but just use it. Um, another thing I want to talk to you when talk about, talking about code is architecture, right? Because this is a, like a deep meaning in there. It's like it's a monolith growing up into the cloud kind of thing. But, well, it doesn't really have to be that way. But the general or architecture is um, very important when you think about all that. When you think of continuous deploy and stuff like that, do you actually support that? Is it actually being supported by your uh, application? Can you deploy new stuff without major downtime and stuff? Um, how is your application architecture looking? How is your integration architecture looking? I'm just giving you some hooks to put some information on and to just give you some ideas to what to check when you get back to your projects on, 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 on Monday or uh, on Friday or, yeah. Um, another thing is that kind of obvious thing again is the code package uh, structure. How your packages are actually uh, connected with each other. Because I worked on projects that were really packaged nicely and everything. But what happened over 10 years or 15 years that project existed, uh, what happened was that uh, all those packages got really super tangled in like they were like dependencies going all across this thing and you couldn't really separate those uh, packages uh, after all. And then what's the point of separating them then, right? Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about tools. There is a circle missing there and there is a funny picture on my screen, but okay. Um, first of all, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, environments. Environments is that kind of the sandbox where you play around with things. It could be development, test environments, that's where you play around, and it could be production when it's like that serious, right? Um, do, you, do you use same routines for deploy? That's the first question I usually ask. I was like, do you actually deploy for uh, development environment and production environment in the same way for all of, all of the kind of things? Do you? How many of you do that? Okay, it's a little bit f more hands than with the libraries, but still, right? Something to think about. You don't have to do that tomorrow. It's not gonna like gonna cripple your system right away, but it will give you a lot of nice uh, ways of checking if you're actually, uh, your routines are uh, working. Not, I mean, because otherwise, if you just do the same uh, special routine in just production, it will uh, not, you will not see that it fails until you come to the production, and you don't want to do that. You want to see it much earlier, you want to fix it much earlier, and you want to like, be happy about it, right? Um, another thing, which is probably a uh, utopia to actually ask that question, because in most of the cases it will not be the case, and because it's too expensive, but still, you should strive to make your environments as similar as possible. Because if they're not similar, uh, again, you will see different things. I mean, we were fixing uh, uh, performance bugs in development environment, which we were like super happy about fixing that. And we were like, OK, this works. We fixed the major uh, performance issue thing, a bottleneck. Uh, everybody's super happy. We push it to production. Nothing happens. But why? Well, because the, the bottleneck was there, but it was in a totally different place because the hardware and like the, the amount of RAM and everything was different, so the things would behave totally different way. Um, okay. Uh, one more thing. Can you actually rebuild your whole environment with the whole just with a one script or push of a button or whatever. It's getting more and more common to do that when you have like cloud deployments and stuff like that. But uh, old systems should probably do that as well. I mean, you should probably think about that uh, as well. Uh, because what happens is that when, when your server burns down or it goes down or the disk crashes or something, okay, you have backups. What happens if your backups fail? Can you actually rebuild the whole system overnight and just like go online and in a matter of hours or, well, hopefully seconds, but that's, that's very, yeah. Um, that one is really funny. Um, do you actually run all, all your environments? Because normally it's a virtual environment, but do you run them on the same physical hardware? 
because it's actually a bit, bit funny thing, and it's really not a very good thing to do. Because what happens is that, again, we were doing some performance testing on a system, uh, on, on a, on a, on a uh, performance testing environment. So a special environments just done for performance testing. Uh, and everybody, everybody was happy, everything was really running really smoothly. We were loading the server with lots of data, lots of stuff. And uh, suddenly the operation guys, guys call in and they were like, what the hell are you doing? Why did you take down our uh, production servers? Uh, are, you, are you sure you're writing, are you running actually loads on the right servers and stuff? And we we're like, oh, well, shoot, uh, checking everything. Um, no, we actually do it on the right way. We, we, it's, it's correct. And then what happens is that, and then they, were, they wouldn't believe us and back and forth and blah, blah, blah. And then they call us half an hour later and it's like, <clears throat> well, the problem fixed. And we we're like, well, what's that? No, well, it's fixed. Go on, you know, carry on. And then we were like, what, 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 what? And then we, after a while, we figure out that what had happened was that uh, both production and that uh, performance testing environment were pointing at the same uh, disks. So when you hammer test environment with requests, it overloads disks, and then production has nobody to talk to, like no disks to talk to. It gets a little bit sad and depressed and goes down. Same physical hardware, right? <clears throat> um, do you do monitoring on all of your environments? Because, well, again, exactly the same reason like testing your deployment scripts on all of the environments. You should be able to see things f hitting the fan before it comes to production. And also, there is a funny, interesting article. It's kind of about how Google makes sure that uh, the reliability, uh, SRE kind of thing that goes. And uh, it doesn't really matter. The point here is that the, uh, the way they create things, and they're also using examples of uh, Apollo 16 when they were like building the whole thing. And they were like, OK, if that is, is, is a slight chance of making or pushing the wrong button, we should prevent that. And this is kind of the way you should think about your system as well. If there is a slight ch ch a chance of something going wrong, try to make sure that it's not going to go wrong. If there are like two buttons and you should never press one of the buttons, is, well, don't put it there. Uh, it's, you remember that SMS message thing that was sent out a few months ago with like tsunami warning or some kind of war warning or whatever, and people got really freaked out? Well, you know, that thing. If things can go wrong, they will go wrong. Just make sure that it's not possible for them to go wrong or less likely. Um, this is a funny one. This is a list of postmortems of like different systems going down, and usually it's a human error. The point here is again, it's like doesn't matter what it's about. There are like pretty big systems, known systems, and stuff like that. But the thing is. It's most of the cases, it's a, a human error. So why don't you try to automate things as much as you can and test them as early as possible to make sure that those things don't happen? Um, yeah, there's a link there. Um, one more thing I want to talk to you about tools. So use the right tool for the right thing, right? Hence the picture. Um, IDE, right? I'm not going to talk about much about IDEs. Everybody has one, and hopefully everybody has a favorite one. I don't care which one you use. I really, really don't. Uh, I just care that you use it properly, and you use it with all the plugins and everything integrated to the systems, and you do it in a proper way. Um, and that you, you integrate it with like static code analysis, with tests, with all those things, you name it, all the things that I mentioned, right? Um, another thing that might be worth mentioning and just reminding you about, you can still do a lot of checks at commits. For example, checking for encoding, checking for uh, lots of things. And even, uh, for example, for encoding, you can actually even convert it automatically on commit and just commit it in the, with the right encoding, uh, checking all the line endings or whatever, you know, those kind of things. Just remember that it's there. Um, you should, again, and again and again, I'm repeating that thing. Automated tests on all levels. Do that because it's, it's a very important thing. It's going to make sure that you don't break things with the, every new deployment. And critical parts of the system, well, obviously, they're test, being tested all the time, even though they might take a little bit long, uh, longer time to, to run through those. You don't have to run through all tests every time, but the critical ones definitely has to be tested every time. Uh, build tools, again, I don't care what you use, just pick one, use one. 
um, they are there for you and they're just there for, for you to be used. And whatever you use, just integrate and build them properly, make them as little manual as possible, I mean, as automatic as possible, and just go ahead. Um, build tools, a again, same thing. They're there, use them, I don't care which one. In case you want to pick one, knock yourself out. Uh, <laughs> but, um, well, last thing. Uh, last thing I want to talk to you about is documentation. Uh, documentation is actually uh, quite an important thing, and it's also quite a thing that is usually getting kind of neglected some kind. Uh, first of the things that I want to talk to you is the tools for collaboration. Because writing documentation is a kind of collaboration thing. So you um, have some kind of wiki, some kind of chat, some, th some kind of thumbs, something, uh, SharePoint, uh, Confluence, Slack, whatever. I don't doesn't matter, whatever you use, whatever rocks your boat, but just use one. Because I was on, on a project and I was like, do you guys have a collaboration tool? I was doing a review there. So I was asking lots of questions and they were like kind of difficult questions. And then I asked this one and they were like, finally, they were like kind of uh, relieved. And I was like, yes, 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 we do. And I was like, cool, which one? And they were like, um, well, um, we have two. Can you guess what happens when we have two places to write documentation? Which one do you use to write? Any guesses? Well, the correct answer is neither, right? Uh, or, well, a little bit there and a little bit there, and then you give up. Um, another thing is that the issue tracking, right? So this is kind of my drawing. I know it's wrong. It's more like a bug containment system, not bug tracking system. But, well, you know, bear with me. Um, the same thing there. I asked the same guys, and I was like, do you have issue tracking? He's like, yes, 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 we do that. And well, what was the next question? Uh, which one? And then they were like, um, we have three. Can you guess what happens when you have report bugs in three different systems? Well, right? So the thing is, uh, some of the things are not the, the, the better, the more, the better, the more, the merrier kind of thing. Some of the things you have to have, but some of those things you really have to have one off. Um, so just to remind you about that thing again, whatever, whether it's your old project you want to improve or you want to choose a new project or you want to uh, have better arguments to argue for, uh, with people who says all of those things that I mentioned is kind, of, uh, 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 is kind of thrown away energy and time and everything. And, uh, but well, those are the things and I've given you some a little bit, a few stories where things can go really badly. And I'll, I'll probably have quite a few more so we can take it uh, uh, over there if you really want to. I try to write down things. I try to write down these tools, like those really short command line tools that I use sometimes for checking uh, things like encodings and things like that. They're really harmless, very kind of nice little things uh, with the URL over there. Uh, I also tried to... Um, uh, to sum up all those things that I mentioned here in a blog post with the URL over there. And, uh, well, I mean, I really hope that you all, we all, all of us, really, when we go out of this room, we will try to um, make sure that the world is a little bit better place when, uh, when, we'll, when we kind of, when, when we're involved in it than the way we found it. And we kind of get really much closer to this little thing. Uh, to the unicorns, to the rainbows, you know, the sunny skies, blue skies, and everything. Really nice. And, well, that's pretty much it. Uh, there is a contact information. You can find me on Twitter, on email. Well, there is a uh, li uh, link to my blog there where, where I try to blog from time to time. It's been a while uh, since last time, but I'm kind of, I have a few things in the pipeline that will coming up. And with that, I will say thank you very much for coming and thank you for listening.